So in verse 3, Paul says, honor widows who are actually widows. Now what jumps out in that statement is actually widows. What Paul's saying to Timothy is that the church must determine who is a widow that is to be cared for by the church financially. Essentially, there are tests that the church needs to do. And in this chapter, it actually gives us good standards uh, or process for benevolence as a whole. There are two points that need clarification made up front. The first is honor, and the second is actually widows. So, honor. In the context of this chapter, what you'll find is that this is undoubtedly financial support. But the context, though it speaks to financial help, it also communicates that this help will be honoring to the widows. It's not a handout. It's not anything to bring about shame upon them. It is actually something that is going to build them up and give them honor. The statement, actually widows, Paul's not speaking to the literal definition. The point that Paul's making, he clarifies in the text to follow. And so the first test that we find, it's the need test or the family test. For example, a church could assess a need of a widow in the context of a dowry. You know, a dowry was when a man wanted to marry a woman, and so he would pay a dowry. Sometimes land was given, money, years of labor, or an act of valor was performed. A little bit of a bunny trail. Many of us see, look at this and kind of see it as barbaric. You want to marry my daughter? Give me this. Well, we still do that. We don't call it a dowry. But I would argue any man worth his salt, any father worth his salt, will demand a dowry. And that is this. If there is a man who wants to marry one of my daughters, your dowry is this. You must be a man. And what is a man? A man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward through Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to marry my daughter? That's your dowry. If I give you a straightforward question, give me a straightforward answer. You, gotta, you have your own place. Do you have your own job? What's your plan moving forward? Be, you got to be a man you want to marry one of my daughters. Now, I'll be happy to disciple you in that. In fact, one of the things we see in, in Scripture, when somebody was trying to pursue a woman, and, and the father would say, you need to do this. What did he do? He did it. I want to marry her, and I will do what it takes. And so we, we don't call it a dowry, but I'd say if you're a father that's worth your salt, you expect a dowry. So when a woman lost her husband, many of them still had this dowry, and what could, be, what could be used of it would be used to support her. So say there was land that was given. Perhaps it would be sold to help her moving forward. But let's say she had no dowry, her husband has passed away, the church would then need to assess further. Another level of this assessment, Paul makes a point to Timothy that she is to be taken care of by her family. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to show proper respect for their own family and to give back compensation to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now, why does Paul call upon children and grandchildren? I, I find it interesting the difference between what Paul says and what I would say. This is what Paul says. They must first learn to show proper respect for their own family and give back compensation to their parents. My translation, because she raised your butt. This is where we reach controversy, and, and I can't address every single possible case, but let's just make this very black and white. It means that family is to step up and care for her. When our mother is in need, it means that we make changes. It means our careers get put on hold. It means that our life changes because she is your responsibility. Once again, God does not give us an out. Well, you don't understand. My mom was, ah. We have no out here as Christians. I mean, or let me put it this way. Do you really want to abandon your mom when you know you can step up? 
Do you want to stand before Christ who, while was hanging on a Roman cross, made sure his mother was cared for because his father Joseph was dead and he was the firstborn and responsible for her and in one of his dying breaths makes sure that his mom is taken care of? You want to stand before him and say, it was inconvenient. Something we need to be aware of. At this time, as Paul's writing this letter... There was no safety net for widows. Now, I don't want to go off on a government tangent, but it was never the government's job to support widows and orphans. That was always the church. It was our responsibility. And the church handed that over too easy. And they didn't have a safety net. They had the church to fall back on, and the church stepped up. You see, the early church was marked by their generosity through their love and care for widows and orphans. When we look back on the first century, they had their own form of abortion. Now, ours is more barbaric, but theirs was more heartless. A mother of a child would have the child and then take the child and leave it and abandon it, either to dehydration or to be eaten by animals. The church, in particular the widows of the early church, were notorious in their compassion as they would go out and find these children and take them in. And this, I think, is a good springboard to the next test that we have. It's the service test. Verse 5, Now she who is actually a widow and has been left alone has set her hope on God, and she continues in requests and prayers day and night. So we know she's in need, as Paul addresses. She's left all alone. There's, there's no family to take care of her. She, there's no dowry. There's no support. How is the church to assess further? And I believe that we see a similar example of this as to what Paul is speaking of from a woman named Anna in Luke 2. She served in the temple, and this is what Luke records in Luke 2. There also was a prophet Anna of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, pretty messed up. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Now, Paul may have used the temple as a template for the church in this regard, but we really don't know. The fact of the matter is, is that the church is limited in her resources, and that's something that all churches throughout 2,000 years of history can relate to. Now, there are some stories out there. I can tell you stories. Dawn can tell you stories because she fields most of the calls, or Ross because he's so quick to the phone when it rings. You, you quick draw Ross. It rings once and it's picked up. Maybe it's like, oh, don't, don't let JR talk to him. But we can tell you some stories, frustrating stories. I remember there was one time my wife was filling in for Dawn and, and I was at home with the girls and, and she called me up in a panic. There's somebody who needs help. And I go, baby, there's always somebody who needs help. What gets frustrating is, for me is, you know, there are jobs that will pay you to call random people all day. But instead, people will call churches and try and con us into paying them something for nothing. It happens all the time. Majority of the calls that come to the church, it's that. Now, there are times where we do need to address it. In fact, uh, as far as personal benevolence, I would encourage you to follow Matthew 25 in this. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? And when were you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? If God has burdened your heart to help somebody on a personal benevolence, do it. But as it comes to the church... The pastors and shepherds are to make sure that people are vetted and the funds of the church are used solely for the purpose of the gospel. We're not stingy. If there's an immediate need, we are very compassionate to help. But when I've seen someone four times for the same reason, at what point have they made their bed? It's a difficult thing. I know it's, it's tough, but... As leaders in the church, we've got to make sure that we vet. You're giving money to the church for the sake of the gospel going out. And honestly, if we 
If we gave money out to everybody who called this church, this church wouldn't exist. Plain and simple. The widows that we're speaking of here, they are to be honored in the support, and the church are to care for them. These widows had only God to rely on. They had no family. They had no no safety net. And so the church steps in as his instrument. In addition, she is active in her service to the church. And this is closely related to our third test, and that is the moral test. Her life will reflect her reliance upon Christ. She will walk in her redemption. The contrast of the woman that Paul is speaking directly to Timothy, that this is the woman you are to care for, the contrast is found in verse 6. But she who indulges herself in luxury is dead even while she lives. Paul continues, we'll jump forward to verse 10, as he picks up with what we are calling the moral test. Verse 10, having a reputation for good works. This word, reputation, it's found all throughout the Gospels. And it means to testify, to witness, to affirm. This is where we get testimony from. But in addition, this word is the root word where we get our word martyr. This reputation is a life which bears the testimony of Jesus Christ in her life. Her life has and still reflects the transformation that she has in Christ. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the feet of saints, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, here we see why there is both a service And moral test. When we have a transforming fellowship with Jesus Christ, our actions and our service will reflect that relationship. I love Jesus. Awesome. Do you obey his command to go and make disciples? So you love Jesus, but you don't tell anyone about him. I love Jesus. Okay, do you love his bride, the church? Yes. How do you serve his bride? I can see what God is doing through Paul here. In fact, one of the personal tests that a lot of pastors will will tell you is, how do you determine if a church loves you as a pastor? It's how you treat their wife. That's how I know. And as a side note, I'll tell you, I feel very loved by you, and I greatly appreciate that. A lot of Christians say that they love Jesus, and yet they hate his church. But if I can go off on a tangent for a moment, let me ask you this. Who is Christ returning for? Let's talk about this. John 14, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. See, that's what a groom did. He would leave and go and either build his own home or add on to his father's home, and that is where he and his bride were going to stay. And then when it was done, he would come back and he would claim his bride and they would go to the new dwelling that he has prepared. Who is Christ returning for? His bride. Ephesians 5, 25-27. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and exult. Give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. To love Christ is to love his bride. To love his bride is to serve his bride. Our salvation is not played out by merely attending. And this is what Timothy was to attest to. Widows found a renewal in their service to the kingdom of God by helping those in need. Widows were vital to the church because of what Paul just listed. She has brought up children. We talked about how widows lived this out in the adoption of abandoned children. But this also, this, this also would be reflected with a compassionate heart. She has shown hospitality to stranger, strangers if she has washed the saints' feet. 
This is essential in the bringing in and the welcoming of, of new people. See, widows, the widows were humble in their demeanor. And they were so important to the bringing in of new people. I know you guys know this, but I'm going to say it again. But when we first got here, we moved away from family, not a single family member. And God provided for us a very special woman. You know her as Net, but she's Mimi to us. She's our, she's our adopted grandmother. We went over there this last week and spent time with her. She's, our daughters call her Mimi. She is their Mimi. And it happened through a spiritual adoption of us coming in as strangers and being welcomed in by a widow who loves people. And so now our daughters have a grandmother right down the road. That's what the church is about. That's what the church does. We step into those voids. And widows played a huge part in that. If she has assisted those in distress, you see, many times those who have been through distress, they remember, they remember what they needed in that time. And then as they move forward, they want to offer that to others. They look back and reflect, when I was going through it, this is what someone did. It meant the world. Or when I was going through that time, this is what I needed. So I want to make sure I provide that for someone. This plays out. And widows have a unique experience. I think of the widows in our church. I see women who show incredible faithfulness to their husband. Women who took that for better or for worse part serious. Women who stood by their the bedside of their husband, showing remarkable faithfulness, service, and love. Frankly, the church needs people who keep their promises. And you see that reflected in widows' lives. In the early church and in First Christian Church Morristown, these special women are essential to the body of Christ. And so to these women, I want to say this, or anybody who needs to hear it, you need to know that God has not forgotten you. And I want to encourage you that even though you are still here, God has a remarkable purpose for you. In fact, I argue that's exactly why you're still here. I've had some gut-wrenching conversations with, with some ladies, and, and they would ask, why did God keep me here? I can, I can understand where you're coming from. If you took my husband, why not just take me too? I understand that, that, that kind of love and affection for another person, but I want to encourage you in this. He didn't because he, he's not done with you. You still have a remarkable call and a remarkable purpose in this world. And the last thing I want is, is for you to not see that and not find that and not seek that because the, the widows in the early church, they made a huge eternal kingdom impact because they realized that I have more time. I have more I can focus. I can uh, direct more of my affection and compassion and attention. And they did. And God used these women in incredible ways. And I want to encourage you that God will use you in incredible ways. I just ask you to be willing. This is what Paul means when he says, actually widows. These are women in need who serve and who love Christ with all their heart. These women are, as Paul writes, are to be given the honor of the support of the local church. I do want to take a moment and bring clarity to verses 11 and 12. If, if you're anything like me, as that was being read, it jumped off the page. So let's just go ahead and address those and bring clarity to it. But refuse to register younger widows, for when they feel physical desires alienating them from Christ, they want to get married, thereby incurring condemnation because they have ignored their previous pledge. First, the reason why Paul gave the age of 60 is due to the desires and marital ability of the women of the first century. Later on in church history, the church lowered it to around 50 uh, because they felt that women around that age were less likely to pursue marriage. But there's nothing wrong with wanting to be remarried. The issue arose when, as we've just covered, the important and essential service widows were giving to hurting people, to orphans, and to the stranger... This would require a focused and compassionate heart. It would mean that others relied upon her. What happens when she stops this service because she wants to marry? People get hurt. 
The issue is, does not arise in her desire to remarry. The issue arises when her faithfulness to Christ is cast aside. One scholar connects this statement. Because they have ignored their previous pledge, he connects that to Revelation 2, where God speaks to the church in Ephesus as a whole. In Revelation 2, 2 through 4, God says this, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have preserved and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. That's some pretty good stuff. Yet this I hold against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. This is true for all Christians. When our desires cause us to abandon our first love, our first pledge, to follow Christ, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, when when our desires pull us away from that, we enter dangerous territory. The further context of this verse in 1 Timothy, it's speaking to someone who's actively walking away from Christ. Along with verses 13 and 15, this tells us of a widow who's already begun abandoning her first love, her first pledge, and walking away from Christ in pursuit of her own desires. The point is, there are both men and women in the church who are at a stage in their life where their service should ramp up. Whether this is through tragedy of loss or through the joy of retirement, whether that is serving because your kids are involved in one of our ministries or you're an empty nester. God calls us in all stages of our life to love and to serve him. And so during this time of invitation, I want to challenge you with this, to ask God to be bold in this and ask, Lord, is my fellowship with you reflected in my service to your kingdom? To be bold in this, to seek this out, to wrestle with it. Lord, do I have idle hands? Do Do I have more time in my day that I can devote to serving you? Or am I throwing too much time away? Lord, do I have empty rooms in my home that need to be filled for your kingdom? Lord, how can I love your bride better? I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm just simply posing spurring questions that might provoke you to go deeper into this prayer. Lord, has my, has my fellowship with you been reflected in my service for your kingdom? Because when God comes in and changes our life, it cannot help but be poured out into others. If we are consuming and only drawing in and not pouring out, That's dangerous. Because I don't look anywhere in Scripture and see someone who is transformed by God and doesn't go. My challenge to you is to be bold, to be brave, and to ask Him. Because change is coming to our church. Now, I know change is a scary thing that a lot of people are fearful of because you think of these horror stories. But, Christian, I want to I point this out. When you became a Christian, when God called you and you responded to his mercy, what happened? You changed. Christian, as you, as you walk in your sanctification, as you grow in Christ, what is continuing to happen? You're being changed. And so when we talk about change in church, a lot of times we kind of go from, your first thought might be, JR's going to take out the pews and put in chairs. That's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about change, what I mean is this. Our church is no longer going to be a Sunday, Wednesday church. It is going to be a Sunday to Sunday church. The change that is coming is you are going to be more equipped and more empowered to go and engage your workplace, to go and engage where you go, to engage at the grocery store, to minister to the lost, to seek out the lost, to disciple one another. And that's something that I'm trying to grow in and prepare you guys for. And that's the change that's coming. It's not we're going to knock down walls and do crazy stuff. The change that's coming is we're going to be more mobilized in our mission for the gospel. Because there's too many Christians in here 
Because I'll tell you what, what I really enjoyed this last week, I, I hope you took me up on that challenge to meet with somebody. I met with Jerry and Francis, and man, that was wonderful. So much, so much wisdom, so much, I really, I enjoyed every minute of it. I hope that you guys are going to seek out somebody to be able to sit down and talk about life with, because that was truly a, a joy of my week. There's too many godly men and women here who are not sharing, who are not going, who, who feel stagnant in their faith. Who, be honest. Maybe you're hearing you go, look, I want to serve, but I don't know what the first two steps are. You go, I want to I do something to serve the kingdom of God, but I can't even think what my first step would be. One of the things I was listening to, uh, I was listening to a, a scientist talk about this. It says, the anxiety someone feels when they're dropped in the middle of the desert is not that they don't know where to go. It's that any way they could go, and that gives you the anxiety. Any route can be taken. And that's where the anxiety comes from. It's not having a clear direction. And maybe that's where you're at. You go, I know I need to serve. I know I need to go. But you feel like you're in the middle of the desert going, but which way? And that's where we want to help you. We want to help you to find that first step so you have the confidence to go, I'm going that way. That's the change that's coming. Not, I want to do crazy stuff here. It's, I want you to know that the first step you're taking is in Christ and you're going the way he's called you to go. That's the change. I don't want you to feel lost as a Christian. No Christian should ever feel lost. God has called us, God is directing us and we just wanna simply help you find that. We will be a Sunday to Sunday church, but that means that we are gonna mobilize and go and start impacting this community. God called people to do remarkable things. And in a culture where widows were completely overlooked, they were seen as inconsequential, not important, we see that God calls them and they serve the church in such a powerful way that literal lives and souls were saved for the gospel. Children were left to die and widows took them in saving their life, raising them in a home that seeks Christ and Christ saving their soul. That's incredible. God is constantly taking the lowly and the overlooked and using them for his glory. That is why his power is made known through our weakness. In that culture, they saw widows as overlooked. Don't worry about them. Forget about them. We're not, there's nothing there for them. And the church steps in and goes, no, these women are valuable. These women have so much purpose. And they stepped up and did incredible things for the gospel. But the same is true for each and every one of us. God takes the lowly and overlooked, and he says, I can work with that. And so during this time of invitation, I want to challenge you with that question. Lord, is my fellowship with you reflected in my service to your kingdom? And really press into that. Really lean into that. As, as difficult as that might be, the Spirit leads you down, and it's getting harder and harder because you've got to repent, you've got to acknowledge stuff, dig in, and see where God leads you there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the remarkable example we have in church history as we, as we see these incredible women stepping up, but also as we see your church acknowledging these women and giving them a remarkable honor of supporting them as they devoted their lives to the church, your bride, ministering to people, loving people, fasting on behalf of others, praying on behalf of others. I pray, Lord, that you would equip each and every one of us to do exactly that, that we would walk in these incredible footsteps of these wonderful women that we would see the change and impact that you make on a world when we would truly surrender to your kingdom and your will and your purpose for your glory. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the people that you've brought here. Be with us as we grow, as we continue to equip and empower that we would be mobilized and go and engage our community. Fill us with the boldness of knowing that we serve the one true and living God that the love that we have for you is expressed in our service to one another, our service to the community, and our service throughout the world. 
Lord, may our love and commitment to you be reflected in how we serve. It's in Jesus' name we pray.